Keshtan and Agenary. Moving on to leaders' questions, I'll now take them under standing order 36. And just a gentle reminder of the time limits. The Hak to Louise arrive. Consider myself duly reminded, last count for or my God. next week, Aer Lingus pilots will begin industrial action starting with an indefinite work to rule. This industrial action has the overwhelming support of the pilots in both of the ballots that they conducted, and there is no doubt in their resolve in this matter. Aer Lingus have stated that this will cause significant disruption to their operations. For their part, the pilots say, management keep insisting that pilots must sell their working conditions in exchange for any increase in pay. We are absolutely not prepared to do that, especially when Aer Lingus is making enormous profits. Now, Tanishta, the facts bear this out. Aer Lingus profits increased by 400% last year. Aer Lingus management and IALPA, the pilots' union, must re-engage, get back around the negotiating table and hammer out a deal. This is the only way that this dispute will be resolved. We are less than a week away from the start of the industrial action, so there is time to reach a resolution, but time is running out and every day lost brings the likelihood of industrial action closer. We cannot underestimate the impact that the uncertainty is having, particularly for those considering travelling to Ireland for a holiday this summer. The government do have a role to play here. Tanishta, I have some experience of industrial relations and I understand well that we will not resolve this dispute here on the floor of the Dáil. But I also know when a high-level intervention is required and this is one of those times. Aer Lingus and the routes that, that they serve are of significant national importance for business and leisure travellers alike. For connectivity, tourism and more importantly at this time of the year for the tens of thousands of workers and families who have saved hard for their annual holiday and who are worried sick that they won't be able to travel. Two years ago there was chaos in Dublin airport. This is still fresh in people's minds. The reputational damage done by that chaos should not be underestimated and the hands-off approach from government at the time meant the chaos continued for too long. This morning on the radio, we heard from business owners in the tourism sector who are extremely concerned about the impact of this potential industrial action as they see their bookings slow down and they brace themselves for cancellations. The tourism sector is still recovering from the pandemic and all of those involved, business owners, workers in bed and breakfasts, hotels, restaurants and the experienced economy need a good season this year. So I'm calling on you to intervene. As reported this morning, the state's industrial relations mechanisms believe that the sides are too far apart to engage in trying to seek a resolution to the dispute at this time. It is therefore incumbent on government to do so. Given the seriousness of this dispute for families and for the wider economy, there is a need for the Minister for Enterprise and the Minister for Transport to engage in a constructive manner to get all sides around the table now. Every influence needs to be brought to bear to turn things around and ensure a successful outcome. The key is to get both parties back around the table with meaningful objectives and a willingness to strike an agreement. Industrial, relaxion, industrial action is not in anybody's interests. Tanishta, you know what it's like for so many families. You put your deposit down at Christmas time and then you spend the next couple of months either saving up or paying off week by week or month by month and you're looking forward to your holiday. People are working hard. They're under enough pressure. They want to know that with certainty that they're going to be able to go on the holiday that they have saved hard to be able to afford. So, Tanishta, I want to ask you, what does the government propose to do to avert the industrial action scheduled by our Lingus pilots next week? This is far too serious to look away. Uh, and talk to the Queen, because here in er, er Lingus, because I help Tachla Kele, Tasha Prynach, to uh, make Kintana uh, um, er Shulanish, uh, either um, I help August um, Er Lingus, August Gaki, August Tadulgus, or who Gak in Irocht a Yenov, um, Hon on uh, Ibsha Are a Retoch, uh, Koluhe is is Feder, uh, Tar Furver, August Tadainra. Uh, thank you for raising what is an extremely important issue. And there is no question but that thousands of workers and thousands of families 
who have saved up for their holidays, uh, who are looking forward to their holidays, are now facing acute anxiety as to whether or not they'll be able to get flights um, next week. Uh, and there is an obligation on all sides to get to the table um, as quickly as possible to resolve this issue. Um, and we, we know the impact will be extremely disruptive if industrial action of any kind uh, takes place in, in the context of, 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 of this dispute. Uh, and thousands of people will, be, will have their lives disrupted. Um, and in addition to that, the domestic economy will also suffer. Jobs will suffer. Um, many, many uh, small companies, businesses, retail, hospitality will suffer um, if tourists are not facilitated in arriving into the country because of a, a dramatic reduction in flights. Uh, air connectivity is key to an island nation. Air connectivity is the lifeblood of, of an island nation. And that is why every effort must be made to resolve this. And it is vital that both parties to this dispute um, act responsibly, re-engage, as recommended by the Labour Court. And you, are, you have experience in industrial relations. The Labour Court has recommended uh, that both sides would re-engage um, in order to allay uh, any doubts around the travel plans of thousands of our people. Uh, and we have a sophisticated industrial relations system in this country. The Workplace Relations Commission, the Labour Court, remain available to the parties to facilitate engagement. Um, and that is the framework, ultimately, within which this matter can be resolved. Um, and the, uh, you know, and I don't want to get into the area, like, uh, air passengers have, cons have strong consumer rights under EU regulation 261-2004, but we don't want to go there. Uh, we want this dispute um, resolved, um, and, and that's the key issue here. Um, and I know that IALPA has served notice on a lingus of an indefinite work to rule, uh, commencing from next Wednesday, uh, the 26th um, of June. There has been ongoing discussions and negotiations for quite a number of months. Um, the, the, as you know, the Independent Pilot Pay Tribunal in December 2023 made its determination of a 12.25% increase in consolidated pay and 1.5% rise in unconsolidated pay. Uh, but that did involve the crewing, um, uh, the cost of the 219 crewing agreement um, as well. And then the dispute moved on to the Workplace Relations Commission. Uh, talks taking place over a number of days in February. No, no agreement was reached. It then went to the Labour Court in April. The Labour Court recommended that pilots receive an interim, an interim pay deal of 9.25%, including retroactive pay increases from January the 1st, 23, July 1st, 2023, October the 1st, and January. And that the, and that the parties re-engage uh, with the assistance of the WRC on other matters. Now, I think within that framework, to me, uh, there has to be room for that re-engagement uh, to see can we build on uh, what has transpired already within the industrial Very relations much, machinery. Uh, and I would urge of both parties to re-engage re as a matter of urgency. Dr. Louise O'Reilly. the response the government cannot be just to list uh, the history of this dispute. Uh, we know what has happened. We know how many times it's been to, 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 to third parties, but the dispute is not resolved. And the pilots are ready to take industrial action. And people who have worked hard and paid for their holidays are now facing the prospect of, as you said now, about their consumer rights. But it shouldn't get to that. They shouldn't have to be telling their kids, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to go away. So I asked you, Tanishta, very directly, what are government prepared to do? And the answer I got was that government are prepared to just list off what has happened and take a hands-off approach. Tanishta, as I said, I have some experience of industrial relations. I understand politicians on the floor of the doll will not resolve this dispute. However, there are occasions where a high-level intervention is not just necessary, but absolutely essential. And this is one of those occasions. People work hard, Tanishta. They need to know that they will be able to go on the holidays that they have paid for. You know, the holidays are two weeks. You work for the rest of the year. People want to be able to get away. They want to know what you, as the deputy head of government, is prepared to do to help them. You said it yourself. This dispute cannot be resolved on the floor of this house. And you invoked your own, and you invoked your own experiences in, in industrial relations. So I'm not going to play politics with this on the floor of the house. I agree 100% that 
that this is incredibly disruptive to many, many families. It's creating unacceptable anxiety to many, many families uh, through the chair, and it needs to be resolved. But the deputy, given the deputy's experience in industrial relations, knows full well that the only way that this will get resolved is either in the WRC or in the Labour Court, but essentially it has to be resolved within the industrial relations machinery. Deputy knows that, I know that, most people in this House know that, and I would urge both sides now, in the interests of the people of this country, to get around the table and to hammer out a resolution um, to this issue. That's the only way um, that this can be done. Uh, and you know that, Deputy, uh, and I know that. Uh, and, you know, you've identified the challenges just as I have identified the challenges. That actually isn't much of a difference in, in what we've both said. No, but you haven't, you haven't asked anything. You haven't, through the Chair, asked anything specific other than identify the problem, but not really come up with a specific Sorry, solution. Martha, thank other you. than as you, whatever that means, thank but you. sure, whatever does that mean, Deputy? Come off Tom, it. Tom, the Tom, only effective Tom, intervention Tom, is the industrial relations machinery, and it should. Tom, that, that is key. Tom, would you and that a case on Gianra Ishakta? Holly Kieran. Kermagas, last Ken Corla. Tony, yesterday, primary school principals were in here pleading for help. Over the past two years, heating costs have risen by an average of 37%, electricity costs by 35%, and insurance by 19%. Seven out of 10 primary schools ran at a deficit in the last 12 months. Almost three quarters don't even have enough money to pay for cleaners and caretakers. More than half have had to fundraise for basic utilities. And on top of all of that, 28% of schools have a long-term vacancy rate with that figure rising to 51% for Desh Band 1 schools and Grail schools and 48% for special schools. Tónaiste, is it any wonder many principals and their schools are at breaking point? They don't have the funding, the staff or the resources that they need to run their schools. Many schools can no longer afford cleaning staff and caretaking staff, so principals are working after hours to clean toilets and mop floors. They have to leave classrooms to fix broken pipes and clean up leaks from them and they feel they cannot speak publicly about the issues affecting their school for fear enrolment numbers will go down and that the problems will only worsen from there. This is causing burnout and 75% of principals have considered quitting. Tónaiste, this isn't just affecting principals, it's affecting teachers working in under-resourced and high-pressure environment, it's affecting parents and crucially it is affecting students. They're being taught increasingly by unqualified teachers who are filling gaps in the teacher supply crisis and their education is suffering. And then there is the disproportionate impact on children who need special education. According to the NDA, the number of children with special education needs at primary level increased by 56% between 2017 and 2021. During that time, Special education teaching hours and special needs assistance allocations were frozen or reduced and additional supports are near impossible to get. Incredibly, the department have no idea of the number of children in mainstream classes with additional needs because they refuse to collect or accept data from schools. Tonsha, how exactly is the department supposed to address the needs of students if they don't even know what they are. It is farcical. <laughs> Even when schools are aware of additional needs for incoming students, they can't apply for the supports in advance so that the child is supported from day one. Tonish primary schools need action and they need it fast. They need immediate financial support to ensure that the basics are covered. SET and SNA allocations need to meet the level of need and we need to address the teacher supply crisis and pressure on teaching principals. So, Tonisha, do you acknowledge the problem that primary schools are facing? Do you agree that all of these issues and more need to be addressed? And if so, how do you intend to address it? Um, I think, Deputy, in, in, in any assessment of our education system, in particular our primary school system, it's one of the best in Europe. Um, it's um, repeatedly in terms of PISA, um, outcomes and, 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 and uh, results, I mean, in terms of literacy, in terms of numeracy, um, our system is, 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 is very high up there um, in terms of outcomes. That needs to be said. 
because your narrative there was one of sort of unrelenting misery and almost a system that wasn't effective at all. The system has grown enormously. and The numbers of teachers has grown enormously. Absolutely up dramatically. This, this government has reduced significantly pupil-teacher ratio. And you didn't acknowledge that in your presentation. Uh, in the last four years, it's been a singular success of this government and the minister that we've reduced pupil-teacher ratio at primary school level. We've dramatically expanded the Hot Meals program. We've significantly expanded the DESH program, which, which comes with it increased financial allocation to the primary schools that would benefit from being included in, in the DESH program and the various bands of, 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 of the DESH program. We have significantly increased the number of new special schools, the number of new spe uh, classes for spe additional needs pupils, and um, the numbers of special needs assistants has risen dramatically. Uh, well over 21,000 SNAs in our school education system right now. So it's not really, you know, I, I accept our challenges, Deputy, but it's not good enough to come in and just give, if you like, everything's miserable and a disaster without giving the other side of the coin. The fact is that there's been huge resources put into education over the last three to four years, both capital and current. We've increased teachers, significant number of teachers in our schools. We've increased the number of special needs assistants. And um, we have increased the number of special classes. Um, and we have to do more. Uh, but, and, and then we've brought in the free book scheme, which is, I think, a significant resource to many children and their parents because it really takes away a very tough cost and very severe costs on families and parents uh, bringing the free book scheme from uh, up, to, up to junior certificate level. And, and I think we will be in a, hopefully in a position in the next budget to extend that to leaving certificate. Um, but, so all of those measures, and then during COVID, we substantially increased the capitation grants uh, to primary schools um, as well, and also would have improved the situation around school secretaries and caretakers. Uh, that also um, um, happened uh, under this government's um, watch. Um, and, and we will engage with uh, the primary principals uh, school network. I don't know if, if that's the body you were referring to that met yesterday. I would have established that or helped to establish that body when I was Minister for Education to create a forum for primary school principals and also secondary school principals. Um, but uh, I think there are challenges and we will respond to those challenges as we did last year in the cost of living package uh, and other uh, interventions that we made for primary schools. Tony, respectfully, it's not my narrative. That's what the principals are telling us. And I think it's really important that we listen to that. Um, and they spoke about the things that you referenced there, the hot school meals and how welcome that is. But one principal gave the example of, you know, the contract for the hot school meals being 160,000. And that's more that they receive for all of the other costs they're covering. So while they welcome it, when they can't pay for basic things like cleaning the school, they don't feel like the funding is being allocated in the right place, and I think they make a very valid point. I recognise the increase in the funding for DESH schools, but what they're saying is happening is that that funding is being swallowed up because they can't fundraise in the same way that the other schools are able to. So it's not meeting the needs, the extra needs that the DESH schools have. And in relation to the book scheme, they really, really welcome that, but they're telling us loudly and clearly it's not covering the cost of books. Um, in relation to the special education teaching hours, that's great that there has been an increase, but the crucial thing is here that people are not getting the special educa education teaching hours that they need. That is the key point and the key takeaway, and it needs to be addressed. Primary schools are the epicentre of every single community and therefore every single crisis. Very Things much. like the housing crisis means that people can't afford to live in Dublin to rent. There's all of these different Thank issues. You, but when they affect other state agencies, they waitlist and they backlog. Thank Schools you, can't and won't do that. So this needs to be addressed urgently. Can you please outline what you will do to address these issues? Well, first of all, we'll focus on capitation uh, and we'll assess the capitation issue, which, which is the basic income that goes into schools to manage and maintain schools on an ongoing basis. We will continue to invest in teachers um, in, across the full spectrum of issues that affect teachers, uh, in, invest in training, particularly around additional special needs, um, also in terms of um, special education more generally, the National Council for Special Education, there would have been an increased number um, of, of CNOs, for example, um, and also a change in terms of, more, of a more proactive role for CNOs 
in respect of engaging with parents of children with additional needs in terms of facilitating and helping them to secure places uh, for their children as opposed to the mother and, and father having to chase down uh, a variety of schools in, in, in endeavouring to get a place for their child. The, and it's always been a long belief of mine that the, um, the council, through its seniors and so on, has to become more facilitative and more proactive in helping parents um, in, in, in that regard. But we will, uh, and, and the book scheme has been a game changer for parents. There's no, and, um, and that money is adequate for that. Michael Lowry. Uh, Tarnished uh, over the past eight years in Ireland, the number of people who have died before an ambulance reached their location has increased by an alarming 70%. Last year alone, 1,108 people had died before an ambulance arrived on the scene. In one prior high priority case, it took three hours and 15 minutes for an ambulance to arrive to a critically ill patient. I have raised the issues surrounding our ambulance service on numerous occasions throughout the lifetime of this government. I have consistently highlighted the fact that the ambulance service in Ireland is in a serious state of disarray. The centralised call-out system has failed. The service was much more effective and efficient when it was managed in regional hubs. We now have a national system which is poorly managed and coordinated. Many personnel within the system have lost confidence in the functionality of the system. It certainly is not cost-effective. There is a massive wastage of funds due to poor logistical direction. The constant sustained pressure is pushing crews to the limit of their endurance. Going to work in the knowledge that they don't know what county or indeed what province they will end up in or what time they might get home at is having a demoralising effect on ambulance crew and their families. Frustration at the inability or indeed unwillingness to correct repeated system failures has turned to disillusionment and anger amongst frontline workers. Many are finding it impossible to cope and are seeking to exit the service. I have had numerous calls made uh, for a complete review of the service, and in fact a review did happen. It focused on management structures, yet those findings were kept under wraps. Details of the report were subsequently obtained under freedom of information by the journal. The findings confirm, beyond doubt, that every issue that I and others in this House have raised was factual and verifiable. So much so that the report was deemed to be scathing in its criticism. It revealed that the ambulance structure is underdeveloped and under-resourced. Six areas were considered to be either high risk or extreme risk. There was a keen focus on ambulance service staff, an area that I highlighted on a number of occasions in relation to paramedics. I have relayed accounts of serious understaffing due to long-term sick leave, exhaustion and lack of personnel to fill rosters, reports of exhausted paramedics travelling the highways and byways of Ireland with their 12-hour shifts stretching to 15 hours or more, during that time, they had no food breaks and no downtime. Findings show that up to 57% of shifts run over their designated finish times. Tarnished, the publication of this revealing report cannot be ignored. It cannot be shelved, and it cannot be put on the long finger. First of all, I thank the deputy um, for, for raising um, this issue, Kishtana Hochtuk E, and uh, to say that. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been a very significant professionalisation of the entire area of emergency med um, uh, medical technicians um, and in terms of the entire ambulance service. Um, and much of that was informed by international best practice, not just in terms of the development of standards training for EMTs, which replaced what would have been a different kind of approach um, prior to that. Because first and foremost, getting uh, a qualified uh, emergency um, medical technician to a scene was the best chance for a person to survive, as opposed to a view that maybe if we get it to a hospital 30 miles away, uh, the first responder was key. And I think that side of the transformation in the last 20 years to the FEC uh, pre-ambulance emergency care council has worked. Um, 
Then the, 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 the other side of that is decentralization callout system that you refer to versus a regionalized hub sort of approach. And, you know, I will talk to the Ministry again about this. Um, but the, H the NAS are saying to us, first of all, the investment has increased on a continual basis. Um, so it's gone up by 37% since 2019 into the National Ambulance Service. Uh, and it has an allocation this year of 231 million. And there's about 2,280 people working now, which represents a staff growth of about 447 since the end of 2019. That's a 23% increase in staff. So we've had an increase in staff. We've had an increase of investment. Um, and then there's ongoing campaigns in terms of recruiting more qualified paramedics, student paramedics, emergency medical technicians, emergency call takers. Uh, there's a huge, well, a significant growth in demand uh, for services with 389,000 calls uh, received in 2023. That's an increase of about 14% since the end of 2019. Um, NAS are saying, National Ambulance Service is saying that it's, it's national performance for cardiac and other life-threatening call responses is exceeding HSE National Service Plan KPI targets, showing improvements on the 2023 um, performance. Um, and the, the HSE used the phrase that the National Ambulance Service dy dynamically deploy their ambulance resources in line with international best practice. So, I, I, and that, that deals with higher acuity, calls versus lower acuity calls, how those are triaged. Um, they can actually change in between a call from lower acuity to higher acuity. I think it's probably worth having a, a review of that or an engagement and maybe a greater discussion around all of that so that people understand what international best, best practice is saying in this situation as to what's the optimum model for the deployment of our, of our ambulances. And I certainly discussed this with the, with the minister. Tarnished, uh, I'm seeking a commitment that the complete findings of the analysis would be made public of that report that's with the HSE and uh, requesting an assurance from the government that failings identified within that report will be addressed as a matter of urgency. Um, Tarnished, I agree with you that the shift and the move towards first responders and paramedics has been a good one and it works extremely well, and they are very capable and professional people. The problem is there's not enough of them, they're not getting the support that they require, and as a result of that, many of them are leaving the system. And recruitment and retention right across the, the ambulance service is a major issue for what is a vital service. It has become an issue because the job has lost its appeal. It's a highly pressurised and stressful and tiring role. And the ambulance service is in need, in fact at this time, excuse the pun, the ambulance service is in need of resuscitation. And the sooner we realise that and the sooner we act on it, uh, the better results we will get. And it does require political inter intervention to sort out the multitude of problems that exist within the system. There's a huge level of you, anxiety Deputy. and anger amongst the service themselves. And I personally believe, like we've done in the Midwest recently, we should go thank back you, and look at the regional model again. Thank you, Thank you, Deputy. First of all, I think that the reports should be published. And I'll, I'll um, speak to Mr. Minister for Health in relation to that. Um, and... Um, I'm at the up-to-date position is in relation to it. I understand it received significant media attention um, in, in, in one publication. So, um, you, know, you know, if a report is commissioned by a service, it should be published or by, 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 the, by the HSE. Um, and um, as I say, the HSE's National Service Plan had various key performance indicators in terms of purple and that's cardiac life-threatening. And then read other life-threatening calls to be responded to within 18 minutes and 59 seconds. Um, and there's a whole load of data there which is now suggest is, is indicating that they've exceeded those targets. Uh, but I think there's a more broader question in terms of the incidences that you've outlined in terms of excessive waiting times and people waiting far too long. And what is the optimal model to be deployed? National Ambulance Service and HC are clear that it's informed by best international practice. I think we need a rational discussion, uh, either at committee level or at some level, uh, to, to get 
under the bonnet of all of that and, and to take on board what you're saying. Tanishta, today I want to raise with you the serious challenges that principals in primary and secondary schools are facing in respect to the ancillary grant service um, grant, the allocation around this grant. Since I raised this issue locally, I've been taken aback by the huge volume of correspondence that I have received from primary and secondary school principals in my own constituency but also around, right around the country, there is a very serious issue regarding the ancillary services grant in terms of covering the services of caretakers. And the following, which I will quote from, is uh, some of the correspondence that I received from one primary school principal. And it's the kind of representations made to me by school principals. Ancillary services funding was in place to play, pay for secretaries and caretakers. In the past two months, however, we were astonished to be told by the department that we would receive absolutely no funding to pay for ancillary services. The department's explanation is that under the old model, we were spending all our ancillary services funding on a secretary. And as they now uh, are covering the cost, we are entitled to nothing to pay for a caretaker. Now, to describe this as a farcical situation would be an understatement. The principal also goes on to note that he specifically sought advice from the Department of Education on how they as a school are expected to pay for the cutting of hedges, the cutting of grass, the maintenance issues and the safety and other issues in terms of the infrastructure of the school if they are issued with no funding to pay for these particular services. And I quote the following also. From my interactions with the department on this issue, he says, it is clear to me that they are determined to stand firm on the issue and simply hold the attitude that however a school has coped to date, they will just have to get on with it and do what they are doing. In our case, if we were using parental contributions, fundraising and relying on tradesmen working for free, well then we should continue doing that. Tanishta, I'm sure that you will acknowledge that it is entirely inappropriate for the department to give with one hand while relentlessly clawing back with the other hand. I have established through a parliamentary question response that the annual total for the ancillary grant funding has fallen from 96 million in 2019 to 83 million in 2023. This makes a mockery of what I take as the Minister's sincere wish for schools not to continually resort to parental contributions, merely to enable a school to maintain itself as a safe environment. Tanishta, I'm asking you today to urgently review and reverse the current situations whereby schools are seeing the value of ancillary grants fall. This deficit is the value of the salary paid to grant-funded secretaries. And it is grossly misleading to champion progress on the secretary's pay issue while concealing the fact that this progress is being achieved on the back of a major reduction in other areas that schools simply cannot do without such as caretaking services. Thank you. Acknowledge, Deputy, in the first instance that the Department has intervened um, in terms of the cost of secretarial services, which was a long-running and wages and salaries and so on, which was a long-running um, situation in terms of education uh, and primary education. But I think you, if you look at the broader picture, um, Budget 2024 provided targeted funding for school communities with an increase in capitation-related funding of over £81 million. And as part of the capitation package in the Budget for 2024, the Minister secured £21 million as a permanent increase in capitation funding to assist schools now and long term with increased day-to-day -day running costs. Uh, and that this supports a permanent restoration of capitation funding to pre-2011 uh, levels for all recognised primary and post-primary schools. So you didn't reference that, but that is a very significant uh, change in terms of the levels of capitation funding um, and it, for all of the schools involved in the free education scheme. Uh, and that 81 million secured for capitation related funding also included 60 million uh, as part of the cost of living measures in budget 2024. And this funding was paid in two instalments to schools in October 2023 
and in early 2024. Uh, and this year's budget increase will bring the standard rate of capitation to €200 Euros per student in primary schools and to 345 in voluntary secondary schools. Enhanced rates will also be paid in respect of pupils with special educational needs. And this represents an increase of circa 9.2% uh, of current standard and enhanced capitation um, rates. Uh, the Minister in 2023 announced €50 million Euro, um, to provide free school books, workbooks and copy books for pupils in primary and special schools. Now, this was a landmark watershed moment in terms of primary education and junior cert. Uh, never before were free books, copy books and workbooks provided in this country. And this government and this Minister for Education, Norma Foley, has done that. Um, and that is important. Um, and in this year's budget, 68 million has been uh, secured to extend the free school books, as you know, to junior cycle students. Um, in addition, uh, centrally negotiated rates for electricity and bulk heating fuels have been made available to schools through frameworks sourced by the Office of Government Procurement, including a new contract uh, to Electric Ireland for the supply of electricity to schools. And that commenced on the 1st of May um, of this year and will run um, for three years. Um, and um, we've already dealt with the extension of the Hot School Meals Programme uh, to all non-DESH schools who apply. Um, and so in the broader picture in terms of funding interventions to schools, um, there have been very significant increases. And also in some of the more historic issues around secretaries and caretakers, a lot of progress has been made um, in those. Thank you for your response and indeed I do acknowledge that there has been positive developments and very welcome and overdue developments in terms of our schools and in terms of funding but the capitation increases you know I mean there were electricity increases as well um, so the, the running costs have increased they haven't gone down but the ancillary grant is the specific issue that I raised here today. And what needs to happen here is that the 2019 level of the ancillary grant needs to be restored to 96 million. It has gone down to 83 million last year, which was a huge reduction. And, you know, we also see a situation where schools don't know, because of this situation, if they can actually employ a caretaker next year. And that's disrespectful to the caretaker, who's the heartbeat of the school community. And I know firsthand, because I was a primary school principal myself for a period of time, and I know how essential these services are, and how essential our caretakers and secretaries are. I mean, the school can't function without our caretakers and secretaries. But I would ask for the two 2019 level of 96 million to be restored. That, I believe, is the Thank only you. solution to this particular Go problem. Government. Deputy for raising the issue. Like school caretakers are essential, um, and they play a very vital role in the school life uh, of, of any school, as do the school secretaries. Uh, whenever I go into a school, I always describe the school secretaries as the engine room of the school itself, because they make things tick. tick um, for, for the principal and everybody else, and that generally is the situation. Um, and, 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 and caretakers um, have a particular role to play as well in terms of the spirit and sort of um, environment within the school. And um, I have seen that um, in many, many schools uh, to great effect. Uh, it seems to me that the issue you're raising relates to how, how funding has been in terms of when certain issues get resolved. Um, because in, in, traditionally and historically schools were in a far worse position when it came to secretaries and caretakers, as were the people themselves who were employed as secretaries, school secretaries and caretakers, you know, in terms of basic um, pension rights and remuneration and so on like that, and there was lots of challenges. Uh, and, and, and over the years there's been kind of incremental progress on that. And when that progress happens then some of the funding pressures on the schools is taken away. But I will talk to the Minister for Education in terms of the issue that you've raised here, and I will revert back to him. Thank you, Thomas. I have Shinjari Lekhishtan in again, Marie. 